Before we start learning about the quantum theory of an atom, there are some basic definitions that we need to go over. The first term is electromagnetic radiation, sometimes abbreviated EMR, and this is just a form of energy which exhibits wave-like properties. You've probably heard of like radio waves and microwaves and infrared rays and ultraviolet rays and x-rays. All of those types of radiation fall under this larger category called electromagnetic radiation. You'll notice in the diagram that radio waves are just a lot longer than microwaves. Visible rays are somewhere in the middle, and then x-rays and gamma rays have very short lengths. When measuring waves, you need to understand the concept of a wavelength. A wavelength is the distance between corresponding points on a wave. Normally this means that you can measure them from like the top of each wave or the bottom of each wave as long as you're doing the same part of each wave each time. So as an example, if you look down here on these waves, if I go from the peak of each wave, that's a very short wavelength. But if I go on the peak of the waves down here, it's a much longer wavelength. The symbol for wavelength is the lowercase Greek letter L, which is also called lambda, and it kind of looks like this upside down Y. When we measure wavelength, since it's a distance between corresponding points, its unit is in meters. Another term we use often when we're measuring waves is frequency. And frequency is the number of waves that pass a certain point in one second. So if you can imagine that these waves up here are all taking place in one second, when something has a very high frequency, it has many waves. This one has more than 10 waves occurring in one second. Whereas down here, if this wave is occurring in a second, there's only about two waves occurring in that same amount of time. The symbol for frequency is a lowercase Greek letter N, or nu, is actually represented by something that looks like a V. And the unit for frequency is hertz, which is how many waves per second pass by a certain point. You are probably most familiar with the unit of hertz when you're talking about listening to radio stations. Radio stations on the FM dial are always measured in megahertz, so like 102.1 megahertz, whereas AM stations are measured in kilohertz, like 1150 kilohertz. Finally, the last way we can measure electromagnetic radiations is by its speed. It's important to know that wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional to each other. So what that means is if I take wavelength and frequency and I multiply them together, I will always get a constant number, which we abbreviate with the letter C. When I graph wavelength and frequency, notice because they're inversely proportional to each other, I don't get a diagonal line, but rather I get a curved line. Now this particular graph is interesting because it shows the wavelength of sound rather than wavelengths of light, but the relationship is still the same. Down here on the bottom I have the diameter of a pipe in meters, and over here on the left I have the frequency of sound that you hear. And so notice that the smaller the pipe is, the higher the frequency. And as the pipes get larger, the frequency begins to go down. And so this explains why musical instruments those that have very tiny tubing, like flutes and piccolos, have higher pitches, whereas those that have very large fat tubes, like trombones and tubas, have very low pitches. Another example down here at the bottom, notice that, again, these are the wavelengths from peak to peak, and this is a very short wavelength. So very small wavelengths will have big frequencies, meaning there's a lot of waves that can happen in one second whereas the wave down here at the bottom has a much longer wavelength. Since I have a big wavelength, then this wave will have a smaller frequency because there will be less waves occurring each second. Now that letter C is also called the speed of light. Right? Invisible light travels at the exact same speed as other types of electromagnetic radiation. So light travels at the same speed as radio waves and x-rays and gamma rays and all of those other kinds of radiation. The speed of light is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, scientists were studying how light behaves. And they noticed that when they shined a light on the surface of a metal, electrons would be emitted from that metal. But scientists had expected to see that no matter what frequency of light they shined on a metal, electrons would always get ejected. However, they found that that wasn't the case. 
only certain types of light would actually cause electrons to get ejected from the surface of the metal. This caused them to wonder why that would happen. So in 1900, Max Planck, he was a German physicist, suggested that objects emit energy in small, specific amounts called quantum. And a quantum is just the minimum amount of energy that can be gained or lost by any atom. He also stated that energy and frequency are directly proportional. So in this equation here, E for energy is divided by the symbol for frequency, nu. Whenever two variables are divided, and they get a constant answer every single time, that indicates that they are directly proportional. And when we graph that, we should get a diagonal line. So you see here that as the frequency goes up, the amount of energy goes up as well. I can also rearrange that equation to say E equals H nu, where H is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules seconds, E is the amount of energy in the quantum, and that is always measured in joules. And then nu is that symbol for frequency, which is measured in waves per second. Five years later, Albert Einstein introduced the idea of the dual nature of electromagnetic radiation. He proposed that not only was electromagnetic radiation wave-like, but it was also particle-like and that it had dual properties, so it had properties of both waves and particles. And he named these particles photons. So a photon is a particle of electromagnetic radiation that has no mass, but carries a very specific quantum of energy. Remember how scientists couldn't figure out why certain wavelengths of light wouldn't cause electrons to be ejected? Albert Einstein was able to explain that. Einstein proposed that energy is absorbed by matter in whole numbers of photons. So therefore, if you had like a sheet of potassium here and you shined a red light on it, that red light doesn't have enough energy to cause those electrons to be ejected. But if you increase the frequency of the light, say to green light, where it has a little bit more energy, it would actually cause an electron to be ejected from the metal. And if I increase the frequency of light even further to say purple or blue light, then I could cause an electron to be ejected, it would actually leave the metal at a faster speed than the green light. But what's important to notice is that red light did not have that minimum quantum of energy needed to eject the electron from the surface of the potassium metal. Another thing that puzzled scientists when they were studying light is the concept of a continuous spectrum. The continuous spectrum is a continuous range of light frequencies that exists in visible light. So it looks just like a rainbow, ranging in colors from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. When electrons absorb energy, they become excited and they give off light. Scientists had expected to see all of the colors being given off when these electrons got excited, but they didn't. So then further research was done to figure out why this occurs. Three scientists that started this research were Johann Balmer, Theodore Lyman, and Friedrich Paschen. What they did is they took electricity and they passed it through some hydrogen atoms. And you'll notice that when you take an electrical current and you pass it through hydrogen gas, it glows pink. And they expected to see that if they looked at that light through a prism that they would see that continuous spectrum of color. However, when the light is passed through a prism, it actually separates into very specific bands or frequencies of light, and it produces what's called a line emission spectrum. So if I take this gas discharge tube, which is also like a cathode ray tube, and I look at the light through a prism, it gets separated into red, green, blue, and purple, and it produces very distinct bands, red, green, blue, and purple. And that banding pattern is called a line emission spectrum. In an atom, the lowest energy state is called the ground state. That's where it has the least amount of potential energy. All these other blue lines up here are known as excited states. And each of these excited states has a higher amount of potential energy than the atom's ground state. When an atom absorbs energy, the electrons become excited and jump up to a higher energy level. But then eventually those electrons will return back down to the ground state, and when they do that, they emit forms of electromagnetic radiation. 
Now, sometimes that's in the form of visible light. Other times it might be ultraviolet radiation or infrared radiation. But what Balmer and Lyman and Paschen were able to explain was that the reason that they got the specific banding patterns that they did with hydrogen is because electrons will only exist at very specific energy states. And so then when they jump up to excited states and fall back down to ground states, they're always falling a very specific distance, which is causing a specific frequency of light to be emitted. In 1913, Niels Bohr was able to take all of the research done by Max Planck and Albert Einstein and Balmer and Paschen and kind of combine it together to form what is called the planetary model of an atom. Basically what he predicted was that if this green dot is the nucleus of an atom, electrons circle that nucleus in very distinct paths and he called those paths orbits. Now the orbit that is closest to the nucleus is called the ground state. And remember that's the energy state that has the lowest amount of potential energy. Orbits that are farther from the nucleus have higher amounts of potential energy and those are called the excited states. Bohr was able to explain that when electrons absorb energy, they jump from one orbit to another orbit. But then when they fall back down to ground state or when they drop down to a lower orbital, then they emit energy and that energy is emitted in the form of photons. The distance that they fall is directly proportional to the amount of energy that's given off. So an electron that falls, say, from the third orbit down to the second would give off a certain frequency of light. But if that same electron fell from the third orbit all the way down to the first, because it's falling a greater distance, it would give off a larger frequency of light. Remember that frequencies of light and energy are directly proportional. So if something has a high frequency, it's also going to have a higher amount of energy. Using this planetary model of an atom, Niels Bohr was able to use mathematics to predict the frequencies of the line emissions. So he did a series of calculations to predict what frequency should be given off by hydrogen, and that actually matched the exact frequencies observed by Balmer, Lyman, and Paschen. However, later discoveries showed that his model could not explain how all atoms behaved, and it only worked for hydrogen. And although we've had to revise Bohr's planetary model, his research started the field of spectroscopy, which is the study of these line spectrums. And we've learned that all elements produce a very unique line spectrum, kind of like a fingerprint, when their electrons become excited and fall back down to ground state. So for example, here's the line emission for hydrogen again, red, kind of a green-blue color, blue and purple whereas sodium only gives off two very distinct bands of yellow light. Helium gives off red, yellow, kind of a green, blue color, and blue. Neon's lines are primarily red, orange, or yellow. And mercury gives off yellow, green, blue, and purple light. 